Um, hello, everybody. Thanks for sticking around through our last uh, talk. Um, so today I want to talk about a situation that is kind of motivated by the fact that trans people are increasingly included in sociophonetic research or even where not included. Um, we have cases like Rob's where he specified that we're talking about cisgender speakers. So people are increasingly attending to um, these issues. And that brings a number of insights to our understanding of the voice, but it also presents some particular challenges. Um, so one major issue that trans speakers call into question is the concept of vocal sex or gender. Um, in other words, the notion that voices can be categorized as either female or male. So this talk is um, going to be fairly broad and kind of programmatic, um, and it's part of a larger project of sketching out what I call trans linguistics. Um, trans linguistics can be characterized in a number of ways, uh, but one of its central tenets is that trans people are neither marginal nor simply exceptional speakers, but rather crucial parts of the gender system that provide unique information about how gender works. Um, so the following questions are uh, things that I'll consider. Um, first, what can we learn about the gendered voice from studying trans speech? I'll give you kind of an overview there. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit more about how Creek contributes to the gendering the voice in the case of trans speakers. Um, and in particular, this challenge that I've dealt with of how we should be characterizing fundamental frequency in cases of uh, speakers that have a really large amount of creaky phonation. Finally, I'll talk a little bit about how sociophoneticians and other people who work on phonetic um, analysis can do better at our work by considering the insights from trans speakers. Okay, so I want to kind of breeze through a couple of um, quick definitions for those who aren't super familiar. Um, so I'm going to use the term assigned sex or assigned gender interchangeably to talk about the category a person is placed in at birth. Um, gender identity will be the category that somebody self-identifies with. So a trans person is somebody who has a gender identity that is not the same as their assigned sex. Uh, a cisgender person has a gender identity that is the same as their assigned sex. Um, and then I'll also be using this kind of um, umbrella term, transmasculine, to talk about trans people who are assigned female at birth, but don't identify as female, essentially. So identify as men or as somewhere on the masculine spectrum. Um, I'm not going to be talking so much about trans feminine speakers, uh, but I kind of just felt like that had to be there to sort of illustrate um, both uh, sides of that binary. Um, and then I'm also going to talk a little bit about intersex people, so people who have bodies that are not easily classifiable as either strictly female or strictly male for reasons other than trans-related medical interventions. Okay, so first, um, what can we learn about the gendered voice from studying trans speakers? Um, and this will be partial, but you know, these are kind of what I think are the most important points. Um, the first important insight is that we've really done little to theorize the concept of a gendered voice or vocal sex and little to update our understanding of this concept. We're basically working with the same model that people were using 50 years ago when it comes to um, how we understand female and male voices. Um, we also find that explanations of sex and gender differences in the voice are often speculative. There's not necessarily um, you know, an informed perspective on why there would be a, a, a physiological difference is just sort of kind of put out there. Um, and the traditional approach is basically for the researcher to observe participants, sex or gender, and to assign their voice to a corresponding vocal sex group. So you look like a man to me, so you have a male voice. And of course, this has a lot of methodological implications. Um, so some questions that we need to consider in thinking about this concept, first of all, do all speakers have either a female voice or a male voice? How do we know what a person's vocal sex is? Um, does having a female voice necessarily correspond with having a female body, whatever we might mean by that, or female identity? Um, and what about people whose bodies or identities are not easily classifiable in that binary system? Um, and I think there are three kind of potential models that could be invoked in explaining the kind of dominant theory of vocal sex. One is that it's determined by speaker identity. Um, so anyone who is a man, however we define that, has a male voice. Um, this does mean that some people uh, that have male voices don't actually sound male or don't have a lot in common with sort of a prototypical male voice. So that's a little problematic. Another option is to say that vocal sex is determined by phonetic output. So you need to have reach a certain kind of threshold in order to be considered um, a male speaker or a female speaker. Um, and of course, this means that some cisgender women don't have female voices and some cisgender men don't have male voices. And that's a little bit strange too. Um, it also means that we need to define what exactly those characteristics are and what the threshold one needs to reach would be. 
Uh, another option is to think about perception, so voices that are perceived as male are male, but then we have raise questions about whose perception we're talking about and what happens when people disagree in those perceptions. Another important insight that we can get from studying trans voices is that the body is important, but it's also malleable. So a paper that, I, uh, that came out in Language and Society last year looked at changes in F0 among 10 transmasculine speakers um, during their first one to two years on hormones, which are known to have a pretty um, dramatic impact on vocal physiology. Um, and it was clear that testosterone did matter for these speakers, um, most of which reached a, a kind of normatively male F0 range during their first year on hormones. Um, but the changes that speakers were experiencing were also kind of filtered through a number of social factors. Um, to the point where the social and biological often kind of blend together. For instance, age was one factor that has both social and physiological <laughs> dimensions that seems like it might be important for explaining variation within this group. Um, and it's important to note that trans people are not the only people who have socially constructed bodies, right? Um, if you think about some of the other kinds of impacts uh, that the body might undergo, there are things like, of course, puberty, but also aging, menopause, um, pregnancy, there's actually a kind of a spurious study looking at menstrual cycle variation in um, voice onset time, and I don't really buy it, but I think it's, you know, it's something that suggests maybe we should be paying attention um, to some of these things beyond just our binary classifications of gender and sex. Um, another important factor is just the total absence of intersex people from linguistics. Uh, we know that bodies come in more than two types, and yet we proceed with our theories of vocal sex as if this were not the case. Um, so if we were considering the speakers that I mentioned in this 2017 study, uh, the question, do they have male voices, um, we might employ some of our potential explanations. Um, so there could be a, theor a kind of categorical threshold that speakers have to cross, um, and I'll come back to that in the next slide. Um, another possibility is that the speakers are perceived as male, then they have male voices, and as I mentioned, this is not only about being perceived by whom, but also under what conditions, right? Because most perceptions of gender happen with visual information as well as auditory information. And trans people often talk about having different kinds of experiences in face-to-face -face interactions versus over the phone. Um, and then uh, the final explanation could be that they all have male voices as long as they identify as male, but then we might ask, you know, is this really even a useful concept if it's just a direct proxy for gender identity? I don't know that it would be. Um, another insight that we should be thinking about is the fact that the gender of the voice is not a unitary trait. Um, so uh, to talk just briefly about some of the attempts to identify an F0 boundary crossover point um, between male and female sounding speech, um, these studies have not had great success. Um, so there have been a few um, publications that have suggested that maybe 150 to 165 hertz is this kind of crossover range, um, but then there are exceptions. So we have a study by Gelfer and Schofield showing um, a trans woman who is perceived as male despite having an F0 above 180 hertz, um, and Gunsberger talks about a trans woman who is perceived as female despite having an average F0 below 130 hertz. So clearly other factors are playing some kind of as it turned out, um, in the study that I mentioned in the previous slide, uh, when categorizing speakers and kind of trying to um, characterize their F0, um, I, I could come up with kind of a ranking, right? But as it turned out, when I looked at uh, segmental information about S alongside F0, it became much more difficult to kind of rank or categorize these speakers according to their gender. Um, and in fact, what I ended up with was a really neat negative correlation where the speakers with the highest F0 actually had the lowest or most masculine um, S's, and the speakers with the lowest F0 had the highest frequency S's. Um, I don't think that this is a general pattern that holds across speakers, but this illustrates that the gendered voice is a cluster of characteristics that need not be aligned in normative ways. Um, another important insight is that the gendered voice is susceptible to ideological influence, particularly at the level of perception. And this is particularly important for us as analysts because it may be the case that our own ideologies about gender affect our perceptions of our speakers and participants. Um, so uh, there's this well-known kind of phenomenon that listeners can categorize ambiguous sounds differently depending on whether, what gender they think the speaker is. Um, a less often reported on kind of sub-finding of that is that this effect is impacted by speaker gender normativity, 
Um, so if listeners perceive somebody to be really normatively feminine versus not so normatively feminine, they'll adjust kind of their, their boundary between this, these ambiguous sounds. Um, in a study of intonation in a group of trans women, um, cis women and cis men, Hancock, Holden, and Douglas, um, compared the use of int upward intonational contours of at least two semitones among these three groups. Um, and they, they found that trans women used more of these upward intonation contours, sorry, trans women who used more of these upward intonation contours were more likely to be perceived as female. However, they also found that there was no actual difference in use of these kinds of intonational contours um, between the cisgender women and men in their study. Um, another paper that I, that, uh, that I wrote um, explores this issue of ideology with regard to, to production as well. So looking at um, the same group of transmasculine speakers um, who tended to hold this idea that uh, testosterone is what gives you a male voice and you kind of don't need to think about anything else. Um, and this is part of kind of the picture of explaining why it is that so many of these speakers had really non-normatively masculine um, vocal styles even as their F0 entered a normatively male range. So clearly ambiguity matters and ideology will fill in the gaps, um, both for speakers and for listeners. So a question for further exploration might be, how do, how do non-normative or counter-hegemonic gender ideologies potentially impact perception? And if you've ever tried to get trans people to do an experiment where they categorize people's gender based on hearing them, you will know that it does affect things, right? People are often just flatly unwilling to do this and say, I cannot tell what gender someone is from listening to their voice. Um, a few additional quick um, observations that uh, I haven't yet explored empirically. Um, first is this idea that the gendered voice is individualized. And this is something that comes up when my research participants ask me, so how do I sound? What do you think? Do I sound like a woman? Do I sound like a man? And I find that as soon as I've known them for even you know, a day, it, it becomes much more difficult for me to kind of put on that naive listener hat and tell them how I think other people might perceive them. And this process also impacts the perception of others. So when you spend a lot of time around trans people, you know trans people, your conception of the gendered voice actually changes and expands to be more inclusive. Um, basically this, right? That the gendered voice is an abstraction and its salience as well as accessibility potentially fades over time. Um, another important observation is that gender interacts with other identities when it comes to the production of vocal sex. Um, so this is something that comes up a lot in my uh, interviews with black trans men who talk about being universally perceived as male by non-black people, but still sometimes being perceived as female by other black people. Um, and this suggests potentially kind of a dual effect. On the one hand, we could be thinking about um, the perception, the kind of ideology of hyper-masculinity of blackness and how that might impact perception, um, but also the idea that speakers of AAL might be attending to different kinds of cues in making gender perception or have different kinds of thresholds for those perceptions um, than non-speakers of those varieties. And this really highlights how little we know about the intersection of race and gender when it comes to the production of vocal sex. Okay. Um, so uh, with that kind of um, as, a, as a base, uh, I want to talk a little bit more about the role of phonation in the gendered voice, um, and this will kind of be building on what, what Rob was talking about. So obviously F0 matters in our characterizations of vocal sex, um, and so we might need to ask ourselves then, what about phonation modes that have F0 implications? Um, and creak would be one of those. So <clears throat> as a reminder, we have these kind of um, a couple of characteristics of prototypical creak, so low irregular F0 and low amplitude or low airflow. Um, and we see this historical shift in the gendering of creak in the sociolinguistic literature. So there were the early studies in the 80s looking at creak among men in the UK. Um, then we had this kind of increase in looking at uh, women using creek, um, but often those analyses would say, okay, women are using creek, but they're doing it in, to be more masculine, right? And then we just sort of build on that and kind of more have a, a strong association between femininity and creek now. Um, and one way to interpret this, I think, is, is through the concept of iconization, um, where analysts are essentially applying this iconicity where something that's low frequency must somehow be masculine, even if women are doing it more than men, right? It's kind of the opposite of how that reasoning usually works. Um, there are other potential iconic meanings for creek, though, um, and these tie into what Rob was discussing with respect to affective disengagement. 
Um, so the fact that F0 is low and isn't jumping all over the place makes it really hard to sound excited when you're creaking, right? Um, and similarly, the fact that you can't be really loud while you're creaking um, inhibits, you know, you can't exactly like jump up and down screaming and creak, right? So um, if we're thinking about what the gendered meanings of creak potentially index, um, it may or may not be the case that, uh, that um, that creek is actually indexing gender. And I wanna suggest that there could be something else going on, um, particularly because we have people characterizing it variably as something women are doing to sound masculine, but then there's also this associ association with gay or gay sounding men. Um, and I'd like to suggest that we can kind of extend this idea of creek as disengagement. So affective disengagement is kind of the, the meaning that uh, we've been talking about, but there's also to a certain extent a kind of disengagement from gender itself. Um, and the reason for this is that Creek provides uh, essentially a neutralized pitch range, right? So a speaker who has a very high frequency voice in their modal speech can access uh, an F0 below 100 hertz if they're creaking, right? So all of a sudden we don't see this really clear binary difference between men's and women's F0. Um, so uh, I think rather than carrying um, gendered meaning directly, we could also think about this in terms of the salience of other kinds of gendered characteristics. So when F0 stops being as reliable as an index of gender, this potentially increases attention to other indexes of gender. So somebody with a very normatively masculine articulatory style, for instance, sp speaking with Creek might sound very masculine, whereas someone with a very feminine, norm, normatively feminine articulatory habit um, might sound more feminine. Um, so a practical question then is how do, we, uh, how do we deal with widespread use of creek when we want to measure fundamental frequency? Um, so I wanna talk about this particular speaker, James. Um, he's, he, at the time of recording, was 26 years old. He's white, he describes himself as class privileged. Um, which tells you a little bit about his politics, for sure. Um, he's queer, gender queer, identifies as a trans boy, uses he, him pronouns. Um, he's from Massachusetts, actually went to one of the five colleges in the Pioneer Valley. Um, and he describes himself as queer, dykey, faggy, femme, boyish, flaming, colorful, sparkly, glittery, and gender queer. Um, so this interaction was our fourth interview as part of this two-year ethnographic project that I was talking about, um, recorded in James's home in Oakland, and we talked about um, an unpleasant family vacation, um, a fight with his sister, uh, kind of finding trans community spaces, and then James's applications to MSW programs. So the data I'll talk to about today includes 17 minutes of analyzed talk with 414 IPs um, and almost 4,300 syllables um, coded auditorily for phonation type. Um, and this decreased substantially uh, after uh, making exclusions, which we can kind of come back to if we need to. Um, and James is the, the creakiest of speakers that I have. Um, in this particular interview, 45% of his syllables are produced um, entirely in creak, and then there's an additional set that is um, produced in partial, uh, where there's sort of a switch within the syllable between modal and creak. Um, so what do we do with creaky speech? Um, and there, there are a few potential approaches. Um, there's the don't worry about it approach, right? And this is kind of the usual approach that works well when speakers produce very little creak. Um, you just kind of let the pitch tracker sort it out and you know, if it shows up, great. If it doesn't show up, that's fine too. Um, another option is to include creak, right? Um, potentially though, this would lead to kind of a deflated mean F0. And the question really is whether creak sounds low pitched in the same way that low frequency modal speech does. Um, and of course, this is limited by what pitch trackers can do. Another option is to exclude creak, but that gives you an inflated mean F0, right? Where you're removing information that people might use and what a creak does contribute to the perception of pitch. Kind of a dilemma. Um, and this too introduces practical challenges. So um, particularly if you're doing IP-based measurements, what do you do when there's creak in the middle of the IP? Um, that's, that's a challenge as well. So what I'd like to do is present kind of three different versions of what this analysis might look like um, kind of in preliminary form. Um, so the first analysis did IP-based um, uh, measurements, including as much trackable speech as possible. Um, so this involved doing manual uh, adjustment to pitch settings for each IP for maximal inclusion. Um, and as it turned out for this particular speaker, 50 was kind of the floor after which um, there, nothing really useful could be gathered. But the 50 to 75 range, which is not usually included, was actually pretty useful for this speaker. Um, so this captures a lot of James's Creek, but definitely not all of it, 
Um, so just to kind of show you how this breaks down, um, here you have your F0 mean, uh, sorry, your F0 maximum in green, um, your F0 mean in orange, minimum in purple, and the range in pink. Um, and so this is the set of numbers that we kind of come up with. If we want to just report means, we might report something that looks like this. Um, but if we want to get at this dis distinction between creek and modal speech, we're really going to have to have a more fine-grained analysis and look at um, at least syllables, if, if not uh, something smaller. Um, so uh, the next analysis um, uh, looks at syllables. Um, so here, uh, this was automated, not hand-corrected, Dear God, I mean, <laughs> thousands of tokens, that would be quite painful. Um, and I've just included all of the phonation types that are available, whatever the, the pitch tracker can get for me. Um, and this is mostly kind of to compare to the next analysis, actually, but I kind of wanted to give you that comparison. So our average mean of zero actually ends up being almost exactly the same number, which is lovely. Um, we have um, some fairly similar numbers for um, minimum and maximum, although the maximum is lower. Um, and of course, the, the range is much smaller because it's just a syllable instead of an IP. Um, so this is great, but we're still lumping all of our phon phonation modes together and not really seeing how Creek is playing a role in this data. Um, so a third analysis um, also looked at F0 by syllable, also used uh, kind of the same methods, um, but here my, the numbers include only modal F0. Um, so uh, if we wanted to kind of see what this breakdown looks like, um, you can see that there's, uh, you know, actually more um, instances of creek than there are of modal speech um, and, and a number of kind of intermediate ones as well. Um, there were a few cases of breathy falsetto um, creek and there were actually a number of tokens that just, you know, the pitch tracker didn't work. I wasn't manually adjusting the settings, so far more than the three IPs that I had to exclude from the IP-based analysis. Um, so what does this look like? Um, so uh, here we have um, a distribution that's broken down by phonation type. So the B is for breathy, C is for creek, CP is for partial creek, F is falsetto, and M is modal. Um, and so uh, what you can see here is that we get a picture um, visually of what's going on in each of the phonation modes. You know, we see things that we would expect. Creek is much lower than modal speech, right? Um, so we're able to kind of give that picture of what's going on in the modal F0, which allows us to compare speaker to another speaker who might use a lot less creek, but without totally throwing out this question of what kind of uh, thing, is, what, what is happening with the creaky speech. How, many, how much time do I have? Uh, eight. Eight. Um, so I'm gonna actually come back to this slide uh, in the, um, the Q&A if people are interested in hearing a little bit more about where Creek appeared um, in kind of the, the discourse context for Jam. And I don't have a, a cursor for some reason, so I just have to push through it. Okay, um, so how can we do better given this set of insights from trans speakers, which is really just kind of a partial picture. There's, there's a lot more that could be said. Um, one really important thing is to ask people about their sex or gender, right? Not just look at them and decide what their gender is. Um, and this is not an easy question for a variety of reasons, but there are ways um, that it can be asked that are better than others. Um, and it's critically important because you do not know who is trans or cis. Um, I, would, I, would ha I would hazard the guess that somebody in this room has had a trans participant in a study at some time and, and didn't know it. Um, so how do you ask? Um, well, there are a few things that kind of uh, make asking a little bit easier. So one thing is kind of the medium, right? Asking on a forum is so much less awkward than asking a person in a face-to-face -face interaction. Um, and then also asking about other characteristics. So if you are doing kind of a, a voice-based um, collection, say, okay, can I have you know, your, your gender, your race, your age, kind of put it in a string of characteristics um, and you avoid kind of the, the potential offense that people could take at being asked what their gender is. Um, the question then though is what to actually ask because there are a lot of ways to ask for this information um, and so there here are a few options one and uh, as as you might expect the last ones are the good ones um, so you can ask just what is your gender or what is your sex you can ask both what is your sex and what is your gender i guess i should say the first option of course is the least trans inclusive option right it, it essentially collects different information from different people depending on how they interpret sex or gender um, it also suggests that the researcher considers sex and gender to be the same thing, um, which is not encouraging for trans participants. Um, and it actually doesn't collect in any information about whether people are trans um, unless they decide to give that to you. Um, another option is to ask about both sex and gender. Um, and this, uh, this is a little bit better, right? Um, you, you've at least uh, recognized that there are possible different answers to these questions. Um, but this has also the effect of uh, 
you, you may be collecting different information than you think you are because um, trans people's models of what sex is are often different from kind of the normative models. Um, so for instance, if I were to answer that question as a trans person, I would say my sex is, is male and my, and my gender is male. Both are male and you wouldn't know that I'm trans. Um, another option is to ask about assigned sex and gender identity to actually use the terminology that trans people themselves use. This of course is, is kind of limited by the, the fact that many people don't know these terms and might not know what the difference between them is um, and could be confused by your questions. Um, so there's actually a, a best way of doing this, in my opinion, which involves asking people first about their gender identity um, and then asking them actually if they are trans, and I'll show you what that looks like. Um, the last thing that we can kind of include along with that is scales of masculinity and femininity to get a sense of how typically male or typically female people might see themselves as being. Um, so this is what this might look like. Uh, first asking, um, how would you describe your, your gender? And we have a nice open-ended question here. Of course, that brings the challenge of having to code it, right, and thin, thin answers, but you're given, you get, you get a lot more information this way, and you can then kind of choose how you want to bin it for that particular group of speakers. Um, asking people, are you transgender, is really the only way to find out if people in your study are transgender. Um, and this question is also a little bit easier than assigned sex, because even people who aren't sure what transgender means, they usually know whether they're transgender or not, right? Um, so people can kind of confidently say, I don't know what these other options mean, but no, I'm not transgender. Um, and then finally, these continua of masculinity and femininity give you a scalar option that you can actually use as a continuous variable rather than having to treat this as just a binary categorical variable. Um, so uh, there's also sex, right, um, which is kind of another issue and something that I haven't talked about a lot. Um, but when I ask people about this, I ask them about their intersex status, and I also ask them about their hormonal uh, situations, as I think of it. Um, so let me show you what that looks like. Um, so how would you describe your biological sex? Again, something that both cis people and trans people can answer. Um, and then actually asking, are you intersex, which usually requires a definition of intersex, since not everybody knows that word. And I also ask if people have any other kinds of conditions that might impact their hormones or sexual characteristics. So for instance, something like polycystic ovarian syndrome is a condition that cisgender women might have, um, wouldn't necessarily be considered an intersex condition, but it is something that affects people's hormone levels. Okay, so in addition to asking people, um, we can also be more cautious about how we've been our speakers according to binary sex and gender. As soon as we do that, we've really eliminated our options for looking at more nuanced and fine-grained meanings of gender. Um, and certainly about using sex or gender to determine acoustic settings. Um, we need to consider different ways of modeling gender, um, and these should be motivated by the research question and also ideally by ethnographic knowledge about the community that you're studying. Um, so to give just a quick example, my collaboration with Kara Becker and Samir Khan, um, looking at Creek in, uh, in young, um, young adults in Portland, uh, we wanted to understand both the potential for sexual characteristics and identity characteristics to be relevant. So after a great deal of consideration and discussion, um, we came up with first gender assignment because we were interested in gender socialization and whether somebody's childhood gender socialization might influence the degree to which they creep. Um, we also included gender identity. Uh, we figured that identity was likely important. Um, and then we were interested in physiology and the possibility that something about laryngeal physiology might be relevant here. Um, so rather than using these broad categories of biological sex, instead we considered whether people had been exposed to testosterone um, in, over the course of their lifetime. So people who are assigned male at birth and are not intersex would be in that category, and people who are assigned female at birth but who take masculinizing hormones would also be in that category. Um, so another alternative to thinking about this in terms of um, speakers' identities, particularly if we don't have a lot of information about our speakers, is to actually um, use the acoustic information to create our categories. So using a cluster analysis to see which of these speakers actually have something in common when it comes to their use of F0, say, um, and which of them don't, and then see how that relates to social categories. Um, another thing that's really important is to pay close accept Pay, pay close attention to exceptional cases um, rather than kind of dismissing them uh, because our theories of gender and the voice really do need to account for all of the different kinds of gendered voices that people have. Um, and finally, um, something that's really important, particularly if you're doing something like trying to come up with this, this alternative model for gender, um, when you're studying trans people, consulting with trans people, whether they're scholars, community members, activists, even your own participants potentially, um, that's something that's really important. So just to um, summarize, 
this, the, the kind of key point that I think we really need to take seriously here is that we haven't sufficiently theorized the concept of vocal sex or gender, um, but trans people can help us see a number of things. The body is a social thing. Um, the gendered voice is multidimensional and open to creative recombination of features. The gendered voice is highly susceptible to ideology. Gender groups are in, in, internally heterogeneous, um, and we need to be more careful in our analyses of F0 in particular. Um, when it comes to measuring and theorizing F0, we need to take phonation into account, um, particularly with highly creaky speakers like this one. And we need to think about what this means for our claims about sex, gender, and F0. Um, so there's a lot we can do to improve our approaches, ask and ask well, uh, model gender better, um, be cautious with binary and biology-driven gender explanations, particularly when there isn't other supporting evidence, um, and really just to ask ourselves on a regular basis, what about trans people? Thank you. suggest it for any speaker who uses a lot of creek. So, um, I mean, if, if you're looking at a language that has phonemic creek and everyone is, you know, creaking because it's phonemic, maybe that's not an issue. But in cases where, um, where creek has social meaning, definitely, where it has interactional meaning, definitely. Um, and it might be that answering that question is sort of part of the analysis itself of whether, whether um, creek should be included for a particular community or speaker or language. Yeah, um, so the collaboration I mentioned with Kara Becker and Samir Khan um, looks at trans women as well as trans men and non-binary people as well. Um, non-binary wasn't even really quite a category at the time that I was collecting the data that I talked about today. Um, so our results of, in that study suggest that trans women are not as creaky as some of the other groups, although they mostly were similar to cisgender women, they were a little bit less creaky. Um, everyone in that study was super creaky too. It's like number, you know, 25% of the syllables kind of thing. Um, but in my experience talking with many more trans women than I participated in that study, um, I do find that creak is a common feature um, in trans women as well. Um, so we'll need a larger data set to really be able to test that claim. But, um, but you know, there are certainly competing issues, right? So there's the fact that Creek is kind of coded as feminine, but it's also low F0. And so that potentially creates kind of a set of competing interests for trans women. Um, but despite that, I, I definitely know many trans women who are very Creaky. Thank you. Any other students? Yeah, I'm just going to Yes, yeah, if I can, I don't know why I don't have a, oh, there's my cursor, good. Um, yeah, so, um, so there were a few things um, going on here. Um, one is that uh, James has a lot of IP initial creek, and actually the last syllables of his IPs are often modal. He'll sometimes produce an entire IP in creek and then the last syllable is modal, or partially modal when the whole thing was creaky. Um, so that's atypical, clearly, um, and uh, in the cases that were mostly modal, it was usually the unstressed words that were creaky rather than the end of the IP, per se. Um, there was also kind of this, uh, this stance type and func discourse function stuff going on. Um, so in one place where I noticed a lot of shifting between creaky and modal speech was between kind of discourse um, content and then discourse management of which also, I think, fits with that parenthetical function that Rob was talking about. Um, so my analysis of affect found the use of creek in both low intensity um, stances in general and then also high intensity negative stances, um, which is kind of where um, this concept of affective disengagement um, comes from in my own work. 
Uh, and then um, another context that I noticed um, was shifting between quoted speech and non-quoted speech. Um, and initially I saw this mainly as shifting out of Crete for quoted speech, but actually when he's being very modal, he switches into Crete for his quoted speech. So I think there's something going on here about switching between phonation modes, especially for somebody who's so Creaky, um, where you know it might be harder to say, here's the function of Crete for this person, because there's so much of it, um, but certainly the shifting. So these are all kind of hypotheses to be investigated as I um, work through more of the data that I have. Other questions for students? Open it up to the uh, field. So first of all, this is really great, um, especially for uh, the, uh, as a researcher, what I'm really getting out of this is what I can really trans ally to, to be better at um, getting the right kind of information. Uh, so I thank you for that. Um, but I actually, it's on that note, I, I have a question about uh, concerns about outing mm -hmm. and how concerned should a researcher be in these forms about outing their information. Yeah, um, I mean, so the reality is that some trans people may not tell you that they're trans even if you ask, are you trans? Um, and that's just kind of the reality of what we deal with in general, right? That we ask people questions and they may or may not tell us the truth, whatever that is. Um, I think that, uh, I mean, if we're doing a good job anonymizing our research participants, then there shouldn't be a risk of outing via reporting on the research. Um, but you know, an option for that is always to just ask people, right? If somebody says on their form, yes, I am trans, to say, hey, I just wanna know, like, how comfortable are you with me talking about your trans status? Is there anything in particular you'd want me to do to maybe make sure that you're extra anonymized or something like that? Um, and you may find that you know, some of your participants are like, no, tell everybody, it's cool. Um, and other people are like, yeah, don't tell anybody. Um, so really just asking, I think, is the only way to do that. And in general, I think we should be asking you know, even outside of research, we should be asking people more questions about how they would like to be referred to and what we should do if something to the contrary happens, say. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of my thought about that. Although I think probably more could be said after some reflection. Yeah, it's really tricky too because you know to do these kinds of analyses while also validating the identities of the people that you're studying can be a challenge sometimes. Um, in the collaborative study I mentioned, uh, we found that the non-binary speakers have a bigger range than the other speakers. So we have some non-binary people whose gender presentation and voices are very much in line with their assigned gender, and other people where that's not the case at all. Um, so. You know, that might be where the masculinity, femininity scales come in. And I actually, um, I like the practice of having people do both. So not just like, oh, if you're a woman, do femininity, but actually to say, this is how feminine I am, this is how masculine I am as different questions. Um, and I think that would probably be a, a useful way to think about modeling non-binary speech. Uh, Emily asks So on the, the study that we just talked about, for our listeners and our perception experiment, um, all of the mechanical terms, so we don't know their names, totally anonymous. Um, we asked them at the end, you know, graphic questions, and one of them was, what is your gender identity? And we gave them, you know, sort of in the middle of your scale on how well you can do this. Um, so tick boxes for male, female, or other fill in the blank. Um, and because these were listeners, you know, it wasn't the focus, but we thought we'd get this information. Yeah. Of our 481 people, 480 ticked either male or female. One uh, ticked other, and their fill in the blank was don't want to say. Um, that seems really low to me, um, and obviously that's sort of glossing over if someone is trans, they need to say male or female, right? Um, but I'm just wondering if you have any sort of reaction or suggestions to a setup like that. Why were we getting such low responses outside of that binary? My guess is that it has something to do with the nature of mechanical Turk and the kinds of people who participate as um, as Turkers. Um, 
So, yeah, I mean, the, the current estimates are that a little over 1% of the population in, um, in the U.S. at least is trans, um, which is actually kind of, it's about the same rate uh, for intersex people. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, we do often have these situations where it seems like we don't necessarily need to expand on things, right, if we have speakers that are within the binary. Um, but it's also possible that if there was a question like, well, are, are you trans, right, that somebody might have said yes. Um, but also if you had like the masculinity femininity scales, um, sometimes I also ask people, or in the past I've asked people um, if they identify as gender non-conforming as well, regardless of what their gender identity is. Um, so you might have found the gender diversity in some of those additional questions. And I think a big lesson from like trans linguistics is that we all have this kind of variability, that the normative categories also have this kind of variability, and that we might get better answers by trying to mine some of that variability. Sexual orientation, you mean? Yeah. Um, I don't know of any any like large studies that have found you know the kinds of things that you could generalize in that way. Yeah. Um, and do you think that would help us test the hypothesis that creek is being used to disengage with gender? Well, I think creek can be used to disengage with gender. I think it's more that it's available for that kind of meaning. And so for a speaker like James, who is both kind of affectively aloof and genderqueer, it really works for him in both ways. Um, whereas for other speakers, it really may be, you know, only one kind of um, function of Creek is, is particularly salient. Um, but then there's also a question of like, the dividing line between queer and trans, right? Like almost all of the trans people I work with are also queer, and a lot of the queer identified people that I've worked with are maybe gender non-conforming or a little bit gender queer, but still identify as cis or something along those lines. So, um, you know, I think it could be done, but it, there would be some complications with respect to those questions. Thank our speaker.